Hey everybody, welcome to the June 2020 meeting of the Memphis Astronomical Society. I'm your host, Jeremy Veldman, and once again, we are live and broadcasting on our YouTube channel as we continue to ride out the COVID-19 pandemic. I want to thank you for taking the time to join us. And as you can see, our background is a little different than what you've seen from some of our other meetings. Those of you who are fond of the spring constellations might recognize this. And this, of course, is the Virgo cluster. Markarian's chain, M84, M86, and maybe you recognize this object. This, of course, is M87 at the heart of the Virgo cluster, and that's the galaxy where this image was taken a little over a year ago, the first ever image of a black hole. I want to thank you for taking the time to join us tonight. If you haven't already, introduce yourself in the chat window. We'd love to hear your comments and questions. Got a great presentation for you tonight. We'll do our very best to answer any and all questions that you might have. Before we get started, just a few preliminaries. You can find us online. Our website is memphisastro.org. We're also on Facebook and Twitter and YouTube. And if you haven't already, please take a minute to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Our website has some great resources for you, including links in the upper left to, among other things, a calendar of events and not much different this month than the, than the previous couple of months. Due to COVID-19, all MAS public observing events and public outreach events have been canceled, temporarily postponed. I realize that things are starting to open back up and we are certainly eager ourselves to get back out and do public events, but we wanna make sure that we do it the right way. We do it in a, in a, in a way that's safe for all of our members and visitors and continue to abide by the social distancing and CDC's guidelines. So we're gonna to continue to monitor this on a week by week basis, discuss it and open things back up when we have a set of guidelines in place to do it in a way that keeps everybody safe and do social distancing observing sessions. So we're, we're coming back, we'll be back out again soon. If you're on our email list, just continue to, to monitor your email for updates as we ride this pandemic out. Before we get started tonight, I wanna to take a second to acknowledge Merle Miller, our new member. He was approved at the May board meeting. Merle is local to Memphis. He's been in the astrophotography space for years. He's got some incredible images online, including one that's featured in the June edition of the Meteorite, our newsletter. So I'd really encourage you to check that out. One of the things that's really exciting about being a part of the Memphis Astronomical Society is the opportunity to find individuals like this who are local to our community, never heard of the Memphis Astronomical Society before, have made contributions and have a lot of knowledge in science, astronomy, or astrophotography, and then we bring them in and they become a part of our community and add a lot of value. So Merle, I wanna welcome you to our group where we are excited to have you as a new member and have no doubt that you're gonna add a lot of value to our society. If you are interested in joining the MAS email list and you're not on our email list already, go to this website here, joinmas.com. Just enter your name and your email address and we'll add you to our list. We send out updates about once a week for upcoming events, whether they're observing sessions or meetings. Of course, we've been postponed for a while, but we will get back to business as usual sometime soon. So if you're not on our list already and you're interested in being on our list or you know somebody who would benefit by being on our list, email list, just go to this website here, joinmas.com and enter your name and your email address. We'd love to have you on our list. And when you become a member, you get access to our newsletter, The Meteorite. And The Meteorite has a lot of valuable content in it including articles from some of our members, meetings from the board of director meetings, minutes from the board of director meetings, an astrophotography gallery, and of course a sky map, a constellation map of, of that particular month, in this case June. So one of the perks of being a member is getting access to our monthly newsletter, The Meteorite. So look for that if you are a, if you are a paying member of our society. Now, everybody tonight, if you're watching this, whether it's live on our YouTube channel or recorded later, I'll have links to these two documents in the description below this video. That's the June sky map and then also our membership application. If you're interested in becoming a member, 
Just simply download, print out the membership application, fill it out, and then email it back to us at memphisastronomicalsociety at gmail.com. Or if you don't want to fill it out, feel free to send us an email and we'll send you an electronic version of this document and you can fill it out that way. So either way, love to have you as a member. Just send us an email, memphisastronomicalsociety at gmail.com and we'll either send you an application if you want to do it that way or print it out, fill it out, and send it back to us. Either way, we'd love to have you as a member. So tonight we have Richard Townley and one of the things that really fascinates me about astronomy is imagining what it would be like to stand on the surface of an alien world. And they don't get any more alien than the planet Venus. Now you can imagine a scene like this, an orange horizon, a rocky terrain in the background, maybe the sounds of whatever you would hear on the surface of a planet like Venus. And what would it be like to stand on the surface of Venus, assuming, of course, that you can endure the, uh, the conditions, <laughs> the, the environment. You see, for many years, Venus and Earth, we know that they're similar in terms of size and in terms of density, and it was thought that they were very similar worlds in terms of environments. But what we've come to realize in the last half century or so is that Venus is very different than Earth in terms of its environment. If I were standing on the surface of Venus like I am right now, I would last maybe one second before I was instantaneously burned to death, crushed to death, and incinerated by the sulfuric acid, aka battery acid rain. You see, Venus has a thick, mostly carbon dioxide atmosphere that traps the heat like a blanket and doesn't radiate it away. So it's a classic example of a world that's undergone a runaway greenhouse effect. In fact, the surface temperature on Venus is over 862 degrees Fahrenheit. That's hotter than the inside of a pizza oven. Hot enough to melt lead. Not only that, but the thick atmosphere results in a surface pressure that's over 90 times greater than the surface pressure on Earth. That's enough to squash a human being flat. And the rain is not water rain like it is on Earth. It's actually sulfuric acid rain. So the, the, the environment of Venus is inconceivably hostile to our everyday experience. Now Venus has been studied since ancient times. The Babylonians referred to it as Ishtar, the goddess of love and war. And in recent years, the Soviet Union is the only country to successfully land a space probe on the surface of Venus and take this image, the one you see behind me before the probe eventually was destroyed by the harsh environment. We're continuing to study this planet, and tonight Richard is going to enlighten us on the history of the exploration of Venus from ancient times up into modern times and into the future. So without further ado, please help me give a warm welcome to our presenter, our featured speaker tonight, Richard Townley, who's gonna take us on an exploration of Venus. Good evening, everyone. My name is Richard Townley, and I am the secretary of the Memphis Astronomical Society. My presentation is about the planet Venus, specifically how humanity has observed and explored the planet from ancient times to the present day. As many of us already know, Venus is the brightest point of light in the nighttime sky, that is, barring human-made objects like artificial satellites. Because it is so bright, humans have known about it and observed it since prehistoric times. Many of these ancient observations are now lost to us, either because they were never written down, or they were lost or destroyed later on. For the records we do have, we know that most early civilizations regarded the planet Venus as a god, along with the other naked eye planets. Furthermore, when Venus disappears beneath the evening horizon and appears later above the morning horizon, there's a period of several days where it is not visible at all. For example, Venus is just barely visible right after sunset on May 29th of 2020. After that, it disappears into the glow of the sun, and won't pop out into the morning sky until June 14th. Because of this discontinuity, 
Many early civilizations didn't recognize that the Venus they saw in the evening sky and the Venus in the morning sky were in fact the same object. Most cultures thought that they were two separate objects, and usually named them the morning star and the evening star, or some variant thereof. The earliest document we know of that mentions the planet Venus comes from the Sumerian civilization, and dates back to about 3000 BCE. What's interesting about this record is, even though it is the earliest known, it shows that the Sumerians did recognize that the morning star and the evening star were actually the same object. The Sumerians named the planet Venus after Inanna, their goddess of love and war. The later Akkadian and Babylonian civilizations would be heavily influenced by Sumer, and they would later worship Venus as Ishtar, their version of the Sumerians' Inanna. Another one of the oldest surviving astronomical documents comes from the Babylonians and dates to around 1600 BCE. This document records 21 years of the appearances of Venus. The ancient Egyptians also knew of Venus, although they did not recognize that it was the same object in both the morning and evening skies. They called the morning star Tiomotiri and the evening star Waiti. The same goes for the ancient Greeks, who called the morning star Phosphoros, the bringer of light, and the evening star Hesperos, the star of the evening. Of course, many of us think of the chemical element phosphorus, with slightly different spelling, when we hear the word phosphoros. The name is no coincidence, because the element phosphorus emits a faint glow when exposed to oxygen, so they decided to name it after the Greek word uh, meaning the bearer of light, but with a Latinized spelling. The Greeks would later recognize it as a single planet, which they named after Aphrodite, their goddess of love. The Romans, who were heavily influenced by Greek mythology, would call their goddess of love Venus, which is where our modern name for the planet comes from. And a side note, if you thought that Roman mythology was an unoriginal ripoff of Greek mythology, it should be mentioned that Greek mythology isn't exactly original either. Aphrodite, the Greek goddess of love, is actually inspired by Astareth, the Phoenician goddess of love. And Astareth, it turns out, is inspired by Ishtar, from the Babylonians, who we already know is inspired by Inanna from the Sumerians. So all of these goddesses from different cultures are inspired by the ones before them, all of them are goddesses of love, and all of them are associated with the planet Venus. It's incredible to think just how far back many of these mythological figures go. Of course, we would be remiss to talk about ancient observations of Venus if we didn't mention the Maya. Basically, when it comes to astronomical observations, the Maya blow every other civilization out of the water. As with most civilizations of the time, Maya thought the positions of the planets influenced life on Earth, so they paid special attention to them. Venus, in particular, they associated with war. The Mayans called Venus Chakek, which means the Great Star. Maya astronomers carefully recorded the position of Venus in the nighttime sky, and they were able to accurately measure its synodic period, which is the time between conjunctions of Venus and the Sun. So in other words, if you start recording time when Venus makes its closest apparent approach to the Sun, when seen from Earth, and when it's going from the evening sky to the morning sky, then the synodic period would be how long it would take before Venus does that again. Maya astronomers measured this period to be 584 days, which only differs from the modern value by two hours. Furthermore, they developed a calendar based partly on the motions of Venus, which, among other things, would allow them to predict the position of Venus in the sky. The Maya were even able to observe Venus during the daytime. Now, all of these ancient observations were somewhat limited because they were all naked eye observations. There's only so much that you can measure and discover with just the naked eye. But in the 1600s, astronomy gained a new tool, the telescope. As we all know, this changed everything. Our friend Galileo was the first person to observe Venus through a telescope. As such, he was the first person to observe the phases of Venus, and the first person to note the changes in size of Venus with its different phases. This suggested that Venus was closer to the Earth when it was a crescent, and farther away when it was full. And this was considered strong evidence in favor of the Copernican heliocentric model of the solar system, 
which at the time was not widely accepted. Some of the most important telescopic observations of Venus were actually made during transits of Venus, i.e. when Venus appears in front of the Sun. The first transit of Venus to ever be observed was in 1639. This was also the first transit ever to be predicted. There was another Venus transit in 1761, and during this one, an astronomer named Mikhail Lomonosov observed a strange halo of light surrounding Venus at the very beginning and end of the transit, when Venus was only partially in front of the Sun. He correctly surmised that this was due to the refraction of sunlight through Venus's atmosphere. This was the first observational evidence of Venus's atmosphere. Furthermore, during the 1761 transit, astronomers at different locations on the Earth measured the apparent parallax of Venus as it was transiting the Sun, which gave them a fairly accurate measurement of the distance between Earth and Venus, and by extension, the distance between the Earth and the Sun. And this was the first accurate measurement of the distance to the Sun. And this finally brings us to the 20th century. Before we get into actual observations made during the 20th century, I want to mention a brief anecdote. During the first half of the 20th century, there was a lot of speculation about what Venus might be like on the surface, especially by science fiction authors. Because Venus is, con uh, is covered by a thick layer of clouds, nobody had ever seen the surface at that point. We already knew that Venus was very similar in mass and size to the Earth, which is why some people call Venus Earth's sister planet. Because it was closer to the Sun than the Earth, some writers imagined that the surface of Venus was like a tropical paradise, covered in a thick jungle with oceans of carbonated water, or sometimes oceans of petroleum. As it would turn out, Venus is much more like a tropical hellscape than, uh, than a paradise. In the early 1960s, astronomers began using radar to measure certain properties of solar system objects. The Moon was the first object to ever be explored by radar, and the second one was Venus. These observations were made from giant radio telescopes, such as the Goldstone Observatory in California. These radar observations provided a slew of information about Venus, including the fact that it took 243.1 days to rotate once, that its rotation is retrograde, uh, meaning that it spins in the opposite direction that it orbits the Sun, and that it's very hot, about 600 Kelvin, although this was actually only a measure of the temperature in the upper atmosphere, the surface temperature is actually, in reality, even hotter than that. And Earth-based measurements were also used to make a low-resolution map of Venus's surface, which showed that it had a more complex topography than the Moon. However, the most accurate measurements by far we have of the planet Venus were made by space probes. From the 60s onwards, NASA and the Soviet Union sent dozens of probes to explore Venus. The first probe to ever visit Venus was the Soviet Venera 1 spacecraft in 1961. This was also the first ever spacecraft to visit another planet, which was only four years after the launch of Sputnik, the first artificial satellite. Unfortunately, though, uh, Venera 1 malfunctioned before it reached Venus, so although it did fly by the planet and it was the first spacecraft to ever do so, it did not return any data. Now, the first successful flyby of Venus was made by NASA's Mariner 2, which was in 1962. And this, uh, the Mariner 2 was essentially just a modified version of the Ranger probes that NASA was already sending to the moon. And this mission showed that Venus has practically no magnetic field, and it returned uh, more accurate measurements of the temperatures in Venus's atmosphere. And over the next few years, the Soviet Union would attempt to send several more probes to Venus. Most of these spacecraft malfunctioned before they could leave Earth orbit, or achieve orbit in a few cases, uh, while a couple of others did make it to Venus, but they malfunctioned before they could send back any data. One of these was the Venerus 3 spacecraft, which reached Venus in 1966, and it was intended to enter Venus's atmosphere and parachute safely to the surface. However, communication with the spacecraft was lost prior to arrival at Venus. This caused the probe to crash land on Venus without returning any data. Uh, but it is noteworthy, though, as the first human-made object to reach the surface of another planet, even if it did reach it much faster than anticipated. And finally, the Soviets got a win in 1967 with the success of Venera 4. This was essentially the same mission concept as Venera 3, 
there was a small probe that would enter Venus's atmosphere and parachute to the surface, taking measurements the whole time. The measurements would be sent to the main spacecraft flying by Venus, which would then relay them to Earth. And Venera 4 revealed that Venus's atmosphere is composed 90% of carbon dioxide, 7% of nitrogen, 1.6% of water vapor, and 0.8% of oxygen. And by the time the signal was lost, Venera 4 had recorded temperatures of 504 degrees Fahrenheit and atmospheric pressures of up to 22 times that on Earth. Now it turns out the very next day, uh, NASA had also sent a spacecraft to Venus called Mariner 5, and it arrived the very next day after Venera 4. And uh, Mariner 5 uh, just flew by Venus, but it discovered that the atmospheric pressure on the surface of Venus was about 75 to 100 times that on Earth, so 75 to 100 atmospheres. And uh, there were also two more Soviet Venera probes um, after Venera 4, uh, Venera 5 and 6. Um, both of those would also go through Venus's atmosphere in 1969, and uh, they would refine and verify uh, the results from Venera 4. And finally, on December 15th of 1970, the Soviet Venera 7 probe managed to reach the surface of Venus. And this, was, uh, this probe was the first successful soft landing on Venus. Uh, so some other ones had crash landed on Venus before. But uh, all of the previous Venera probes, uh, none of them were intended to survive until they reached the surface. And uh, none of them did until this one. And just before Venera 7 reached the surface, though, its uh, main parachute failed, which caused it to hit the surface at about 37 miles per hour, and uh, that means it rolled over onto its side. So you can see it looks like a little bucket, and uh, basically it tipped over and fell uh, once it reached the surface. So that limited the amount of data that it was able to send back, but it did tell us that Venus has a surface temperature of 887 degrees Fahrenheit, which proved beyond any shadow of, uh, any shadow of a doubt that humans cannot possibly survive on Venus, that liquid water cannot exist on the surface of Venus, and that it certainly is not a tropical paradise. And Venera 8 was the next probe to land on the surface of Venus after Venera 7. Uh, Venera 8 confirmed all of the measurements taken by Venera 7, and Venera 8 also showed that Venus's cloud layer begins at 22 miles above the surface. Uh, this is much higher up than any of the clouds on Earth, where the highest clouds only reach up to about 13 miles above the surface, uh, which means that the bottom of the cloud layer on Venus is about twice as high as the tops of the highest clouds on Earth. Furthermore, Venera 8 contained a gamma-ray spectrometer, which was used to measure the composition of Venus's crust. The spectrometer found that it was similar to alkali basalt rocks on Earth. And alkali basalt rocks are igneous rocks, which means they're formed from cooling lava. Um, so this suggested that Venus may have volcanoes on its surface. And finally, the onboard photometer, which was used earlier to determine when the clouds ended, uh, also found that light levels on the surface of Venus were similar to those of an overcast day on Earth, which means that surface photography was possible. And this would influence the design of the next Soviet Venus landers, Venera 9 and Venera 10. Now, Venera 9 holds a double record. Uh, with all of the previous Venera missions, the interplanetary bus part of the spacecraft, uh, meaning the part of the lander, th uh, the part of the spacecraft that the lander detached from, um, that part either simply flew by the planet Venus or it disintegrated in the atmosphere. But with Venera 9, the interplanetary bus did not fly by Venus, but rather it inserted itself into Venus orbit. So this made it the first ever artificial satellite of the planet Venus. Furthermore, because the results from Venera 8 showed good conditions for photography, the Venera, line, uh, the Venera 9 lander carried cameras on board. And so the lander took a panoramic picture of the landing site, which you can see here. But starting with this probe, though, the Soviets had the absolute worst luck with their panoramic cameras. So there were actually supposed to be two panoramas taken from Venera 9, but there was a malfunction uh, with the lens cap of the second camera due to the extreme atmospheric pressure on the surface. Uh, so the lens cap of the second camera ended up not popping off as it was designed to. So uh, that means it only was able to return one panorama because the other one just was total blackness because it was just seeing the inside of the lens cap. 
Uh, Venera 9 also confirmed that the bottom of Venus's cloud layer starts at 22 miles, and it measured clouds that were up to 25 miles thick, which again is much, much thicker um, than any of the clouds on Earth by a long shot. And it also detected traces of hydrochloric acid and hydrofluoric acid in the atmosphere, along with bromine and iodine, uh, since some not very friendly molecules there. And uh, finally, it showed that wind speeds on the surface of Venus are very low due to the extremely high atmospheric pressure. And so the lander transmitted data for about 53 minutes until the re uh, relaying orbiter moved out of range. And uh, by the time it came back in range again, um, the probe was no longer functioning due to probably having just been melted by the extremely high temperatures. And uh, the Venera 9 orbiter was also equipped with cameras of its own. And uh, since it was now a permanent satellite of Venus, it conducted a long-term survey of Venus's cloud structure and dynamics. And the orbiter returned several panoramas of Venus's clouds, a couple of which you can see here. And uh, Venera 10 was the sister craft to Venera 9, and it was launched only a few days afterwards, and it similarly arrived at Venus a few days uh, after Venera 9. And the Venera 10 orbiter and lander returned similar information uh, as that of Venera 9, but unfortunately, Venera 10 encountered the exact same lens cap problem as that of Venera 9, so only one panorama was returned. And the next pair of landers to visit Venus were Venera 11 and Venera 12, and you can see what their lander design looked like on the left here. Um, these landers each had two color cameras on board, but this time, all of the lens caps failed to pop off for both landers when they reached the surface. That's four lens cap failures, uh, well, two, two per uh, lander here that failed. Um, so no images of Venus surface were returned by these missions at all. And uh, these probes also had soil analyzers on board, but again, both analyzers failed on both probes. But the probes were successful in providing evidence for lightning on Venus, as well as detecting sulfur and chlorine in the cloud layers. Now at around this same time, NASA sent its own pair of spacecraft to Venus, uh, the Pioneer Venus Orbiter and the Pioneer Venus Multiprobe. And uh, you can see the Pioneer Venus Orbiter here. Um, this one was, I think, launched in the late 70s, and it actually stayed in orbit around Venus until the early 90s, returned a lot of data. And uh, the multiprobe uh, consisted of four separate atmospheric probes that would enter Venus's atmosphere at uh, different locations. And these probes discovered that Venus has three distinct layers of clouds, and that Venus's atmosphere has a different ratio of argon isotopes to that of Earth, uh, to Earth's atmosphere, that is, suggesting that Venus's atmosphere formed very differently from Earth's did. And uh, the Soviet Union sent yet another pair of Venera probes to Venus in 1981. And Venera 13 and 14 were identical, and they both returned complete color panoramas of their landing sites, so finally uh, the lens caps didn't fail. Um, each lander also contained a drill, uh, which retrieved, uh, retrieved a soil sample, and uh, when analyzed, the samples from both probes appeared to be a type of igneous rock, um, suggesting that it might have been formed from a volcano. And each lander also had a spring-loaded arm to measure the compressibility of the soil at the landing site, uh, which you can see here in this picture. And for Venera 13, its arm worked as anticipated. Uh, here are the panorama images for Venera 14. Um, as you can see in this image, though, the compressibility probe had a little problem. Uh, the lens cap from the camera it managed to fall on the exact spot that the arm was going to measure. Uh, so the arm ended up measuring the compressibility of the lens cap instead of the compressibility of the soil. So they really just had a lot of lens cap problems throughout this entire uh, mission series. And uh, here are a couple of other uh, pictures, uh, or panoramas, um, taken by both of these landers. Um, so yeah, very interesting um, pictures from the surface here. And in 1983, uh, the Soviet Union sent yet another pair of probes to Venus. And uh, this time, though, they were both orbiters, and uh, they did not have any landers or atmospheric components. So they just orbited the planet Venus. And uh, their mission was basically to map the surface of Venus using radar. And each spacecraft was placed into a highly eccentric polar orbit above Venus, um, with the closest approach happening over Venus's North Pole. 
and each time the spacecraft came close to the planet, it would perform a radar sweep of the area directly beneath it. And Venus's natural rotation would allow it to sweep out a different area each time it made a close approach. Due to the way their orbits were set up, um, each probe was only able to map from the North Pole down to about 30 degrees north, or about 25% of the surface of Venus. And they continued mapping for about 8 months until they had covered all of the area they could. And uh, here is the resulting radar map that uh, these two probes came up with. And uh, the last pair of Soviet probes to visit the planet Venus were Vega 1 and Vega 2. The interplanetary bus part of both of these missions would fly by Venus, and eventually would go on to visit Halley's Comet close up, uh, because this was during the time of its return to the inner solar system, but we're only concerned with the Venus portion of these missions. Uh, each lander was basically the same as the previous Venera landers, and each one returned nearly the same results, uh, except for pictures, as both of them landed on the nighttime side of Venus. The only real new discoveries by these landers were that the top two cloud layers on Venus are composed of sulfuric acid droplets, um, while the lower one is composed of a phosphoric acid solution. Uh, however, the most interesting part of these missions uh, was the balloon probe that each lander released in the atmosphere of Venus. So previously, the Venera missions had only taken data on Venus's atmosphere as they drifted down through it towards the surface. But this time, as the landers were passing through the atmosphere, each one released a small balloon with a probe attached to it. And the balloons were inflated when they reached an altitude of about 54 kilometers, uh, which is right in the middle most active layer of Venus's three-tiered cloud system. And they floated along at about that altitude for about two days, uh, traversing a distance of about 11,000 kilometers each, or about 30% of the circumference of Venus. Their average speeds were 154 miles per hour, the average temperature at their altitude was only 98 degrees Fahrenheit, and the average atmospheric pressure was half that of Earth's at sea level. So uh, this is probably the least deadly place for a human to be on Venus. Uh, the only thing uh, that will kill you here are the toxic gases, uh, the lack of oxygen, and the extreme turbulence. So considering the alternatives, this part of Venus really isn't so bad. And uh, that was basically it. Uh, the Venera probes mark the end of the Soviet space program's exploration of Venus. So with a whopping 15 successful missions to Venus, I think it's fair to say that if Mars is NASA's planet, because they've done the most exploration of it, then Venus is the planet of the Soviet Union. But this was not the end of humanity's exploration of Venus. The next orbiter to visit the planet, NASA's Magellan spacecraft, is possibly the single most important orbiter to ever visit Venus. Magellan's mission was similar to that of Venera 15 and 16, namely to map the surface of Venus via radar. However, Magellan carried a much more accurate radar than the Venera probe six years before it, and its orbit allowed it to map the entire surface of Venus. Magellan mapped the surface of Venus with a resolution of about 100 meters, which is equivalent to most visible, life fo uh, visible light photographs of other planets. To date, the radar maps returned by Magellan are still the most accurate and highly detailed maps of Venus's surface we have. Magellan's data also told us a lot about the geology of Venus. We already knew that Venus had volcanoes, but Magellan did not find any evidence of plate tectonics on Venus, suggesting that Venus's volcanoes must operate via, via a different method than those on Earth. Furthermore, it found relatively few impact craters, suggesting a young surface, but again, there are no plate tectonics. And after Magellan, the European Space Agency launched Venus Express, which reached Venus in 2006. This spacecraft found evidence for past oceans on Venus, as well as a massive double vortex at Venus's south pole. It also discovered that the uh, it also discovered the presence of ozone in the upper, upper atmosphere of Venus, and a cold area in Venus's atmosphere where carbon dioxide might freeze and rain down as dry ice, uh, which would then sublimate again long before it could ever reach the surface. The most recent spacecraft sent to Venus was the Japanese Akatsuki orbiter, which is still in orbit, and it is studying the atmosphere of Venus. Uh, one of its key findings is evidence that there is a massive jet stream in Venus's atmosphere near the equator. And the probe is still collecting data on Venus, and uh, much of the data has yet to be analyzed. And those are all of the probes that humans have sent to Venus. 
So to summarize everything that we've learned so far about Venus, um, it's extremely hot on Venus with surface temperatures uh, 900, uh, 900 degrees Fahrenheit, sometimes even a little higher. Um, atmospheric pressure at the surface is over 90 times that of Earth at sea level. Its atmosphere is composed mainly of carbon dioxide, and its towering clouds are composed mainly of sulfuric acid. It, it has the most volcanoes of any planet in the solar system, and it has a geologically young surface, but the volcanoes are all dormant, and there is no evidence of plate tectonics. It spins very slowly, taking 243 days to make one complete rotation, and its rotation is also retrograde. Uh, it has almost no magnetic field and no Van Allen radiation belts, which is unlike Earth. Uh, it may have had oceans at one point in its past. Uh, it has uh, 150 mile per hour winds uh, in the cloud layers, but almost no winds on the surface due to the extreme pressure. And it is absolutely not a tropical paradise. So all in all, Venus is a fascinating planet, but it's a terrible choice for your next off-world vacation. Have you considered Mars instead? And that is the end of my presentation. Okay, thank you, Richard. Yeah, Venus. Don't know if I'd ever want to go there. That's one of those planets that I would classify kind of as a, a no-brainer. Uh, clearly, there's no life, certainly on the surface of Venus, maybe somewhere high up in the cloud deck, but uh, not, a, not a destination that we would necessarily want to go to search for life. So if you guys have any comments or questions, uh, please leave them in the chat. I'm going to check that right now while I'm, uh, while I'm looking at this here. So um, yeah. So now just kind of wrapping up here. I've um, got a couple things I want to cover here just as we're, uh, as we're wrapping the meeting up. First of all, I want to thank everyone once again for taking the time to listen um, and participate in tonight's meeting. So, you know, we are live. So <laughs> anyway, from, uh, from Venus to Mars, I thought this would be appropriate to wrap up as we, uh, as we wrap up the, uh, the meeting tonight. This is an image of Jezero Crater on the surface of Mars. And I don't know how many of you have checked, um, have, have, uh, have watched the news recently, but Mars has gotten really interesting. It's appropriate that Richard ended his presentation tonight with Mars because Mars is starting to get very interesting. So I don't know if you guys watched 60 Minutes this past Sunday, but um, they featured a segment on the next US mission to Mars. They're actually working on a probe, appropriately enough, called Perseverance. And here you can see an image of that probe. And it is going to land, uh, the, the, the target is here, Jezero Crater. And the reason is because the, uh, the features of Jezero Crater make it um, one of the possible spots to target for ancient life, microbial life on the surface of Mars. And if you missed the uh, 60 minute segment this past Sunday, you can actually catch it online. Um, let me go ahead and show it to you here a minute in case some of you would, uh, would like to watch it. So, hang on just a second here. So there it is. Uh, you can go to that link right there. Or just do a Google search for 60 minutes Mars, US Mars mission or Mar uh, Mars Perseverance mission. So again, it's heading to Jezero Crater. It's a new mission to Mars, NASA's most ambitious one yet. The goal is to land a new vehicle, a high-tech rover, to search for signs of ancient life on the red planet and eventually bring that evidence back to Earth. Blast off is less than two months away. We've got a two-month window, whether we, got to, we either got to go in the next two months or it's gonna be like another year and a half before we can go. If all goes according to plan, Perseverance will arrive at the Jezero Crater on February 2021. It'll explore the area for at least two years. The rock samples Perseverance collects will most likely be left on the surface of Mars. And that's just the beginning of what NASA, one NASA official has described as probably the most complex scientific mission the agency has ever undertaken. Years later, a new rover will arrive to fetch the tubes put them on a small rocket ship and launch them into orbit 
around the red planet, and another spacecraft will already be waiting there in orbit around Mars, and the samples will be passed to it in a container the size of a soccer ball. The samples will then be transported back to Earth's atmosphere and dropped off on Earth. So the Perseverance probe that NASA is about to launch in a couple of months is basically step one in a years-long quest to go to the red planet, Mars, collect soil samples, and bring them back to Earth and analyze them. So be looking for that in uh, the next couple of months. Now, also, China is starting to make the news regarding their plans to explore Mars. And they are getting ready. I don't know how many of you subscribe to Sky and Telescope magazine. If you get the June edition of Sky and Telescope, this was written up. They're launching HX1, I'll call it, because my Chinese pronunciation is not very good. It's scheduled to launch next month, July of 2020, for Mars. Aboard this, the long Mars 5 rocket, which was tested a few months ago successfully, so now they have a vehicle to transport um, a probe and a rover to Mars instead of hitching a ride from somebody else. Here's a website that details their program. The mission will consist of both an orbiter equipped with a suite of science payloads and medium and high resolution cameras, the latter comparable to high rise of NASA's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter and a small 240 kilogram rover. With a design lifetime of 90 days, the rover seeks to discover the distribution of water ice under the Martian surface using ground penetrating radar an instrument that has never been deployed on Mars' surface. It will also carry its own laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy equipment, similar to that of Curiosity, as well as equipment to analyze the climate, magnetic field, and surface composition of Mars. So, up until now, NASA has been the only program to successfully operate on the Red Planet for more than a mission. But that could all change. And the fact that China is ready to make such a, an attempt demonstrates the huge strides that their space program has taken. So suddenly China has gotten very interesting and the space race has gotten very interesting. You know, we, we talk about the, uh, the race to get back to the moon. Well, the exploration of some of the planets and specifically Mars, because it's one of the targets for the possibility of primitive ancient life is also getting interesting. Now, another thing that's happening regarding Mars uh, for the next four months, Mars Apparition 2020, it's gonna be growing and getting steadily larger in the night sky. And June is really where the size of Mars gets to a point where it starts to become observable, the, the surface features. So, and this apparition is gonna take us until about mid-October, well, early October, October the 6th is when opposition is. So between now and October, we got a four month window where Mars gets really interesting. The red planet won't be this close to Earth again until the year 2035. On June 12th, Mars, Mars grows to 10 arc seconds in diameter, half as large as it will be at opposition on October the 6th. But at 10 arc seconds, that's the generally accepted minimum size at which useful observations can be made. So now is the time to start getting acquainted with the planet's most prominent surface markings called albedo features. The Martian South Polar Cap, which is the white uh, cap that you see in the, uh, in the top of this image, it's inverted, so south is up, north is down, throughout June and appears glaringly white like snow on a sunny day. As seen one hour before sunrise, the planet stands some 28 degrees high in Aquarius on June 1st and climbs to 39 degrees by month's end. During that span, its ruddy disk shows, grows from 9.3 arc seconds to 11.4 arc seconds. June offers observers another advantage, a lower probability of those infamous Martian dust storms ruining the view. So I don't know how many of you remember the opposition from two years ago. Mars was bright orange and brilliant in the summer sky the problem is it was in the middle of a planet-wide dust storm. So when you look at it through a telescope, all you could see is just basically a, uh, a blotted uh, orange disk instead of seeing the surface features. So it turned, to be a, be, turned out to be kind of a disappointment. But now 
is actually a good time to start looking at the surface of Mars again and possibly catch some of these albedo features, surface markings, including the south polar cap. So if you're an early riser, I'm not necessarily an early riser, but uh, this is definitely worth something getting up for. Look in the southeast sky this month, June, uh, toward the uh, first quarter or the third quarter moon as we get toward the uh, middle of June and Fomalhaut, and you should be able to spot Mars. And now's a good time to start, to start uh, looking at Mars. And again, to read more, the June edition of Sky and Telescope magazine has a write-up on both of these articles, and you can catch it all, all there. So check that out. Okay, I'm going to check the chat window one more time, see if there are any more comments or, or questions here as we wind down the program tonight. So, great job, Richard. Kudos to Richard. Very good presentation. Uh, do you have any idea how many volcanoes it had? Uh, surface of Venus. That's a good question. I don't know. It doesn't have plate tectonics. If Richard's online, maybe you can answer that question or uh, we can follow up. Um, the, uh, the, yeah. One of these days we got to do a presentation on the actual, um, really the uniqueness of Earth's crust in comparison to other planets. One of the things that makes Earth so unique is not just, you know, the, the abundance of water and the magnetic field, but also the plate tectonics on Earth. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but there aren't that many planets. Maybe there may not be any other planets that we know of, certainly near us that are are, are uh, able, able to be observed that have the type of uh, dynamic surface that the Earth has. So Venus, again, is another, is another example of that, type of, uh, of that type of world. So 1,000 volcanoes, he said. Wow, 1,000 volcanoes on the surface of, of Venus. Yeah, I won't be in, well, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to follow up on Rick's comment because we're recording right now, but uh, point taken. I, I noticed that too. He mentioned that several times in the, in the presentation. Got to get the lens cap right, as we were working on earlier today, right? Okay, actually over a thousand. Very good. Okay, just kind of wrapping up. Again, I'll make these two documents available for everyone in the description. And uh, so if you want to download either the June Sky Map or a membership application, just uh, click on the links. I'll have links to both of these documents in the description below this video. And again, if you're interested in becoming a member, if you're not a member already, just download the membership application, fill it out, scan it, and email it back to us at memphisastronomicalsociety at gmail.com. Or just send us an email and we can send you an electronic version of this document so you can just fill it out without having to handwrite it and scan it and send it back to us. So look for links to these two documents in the description below once uh, I get done posting the video in a few minutes. Again, our website is memphisastro.org. Stay tuned for updates on our next meeting as well as other events when we start opening things back up. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter. Take a moment to subscribe to this YouTube channel if you haven't already. And if you'd like to join the Memphis Astronomical Society, if you'd like to get on our, on our email list, go to joinmas.com, enter your name and your email address. And again, we'll send you weekly updates as we receive them. So um, that wraps up our meeting this month, June 2020. I want to thank all of you for taking the time to, to participate tonight. And there's a lot going on in the world right now. We will get through this. So we're going to kind of end the meeting now. It's a little bit of a shorter meeting. I want to encourage all of you to continue to take the, the necessary measures to stay safe and, uh, you know, just to ride this out. Um, 2020 has been an unusual year, but things will get back to normal, whatever, whatever normal means at some point in time. We will get back to meeting regularly and we'll have this video completely posted online so you can rewatch it again if you'd like to. And yeah, just uh, yeah, just stay tuned for updates for our next MAS meeting. 
and we'll send those out via very soon via email. So again, guys, want to thank you for taking the time to participate. Wish you all the best, and we will see you very, very soon. Have a great night. Have a great weekend. Stay safe, and God bless.